If you were to get a pirated copy of Spyro Year of the Dragon all the way back at the turn of the century, you'd be able to play the game normally at first. Game crackers managed to bypass the game's crack protection just like they had every other major release at the time, and since the first few worlds played normally, they assumed this game was just like any other one. For the players trying to complete the game, though, they noticed some... odd occurrences. Once those first few levels were over and you went to check out the hot air balloon travel system, Zoe would tell you this. I'm sorry, Spyro, but you seem to be playing a hacked version of this game. This may be an illegal copy. Since this copy has been modified, you may experience problems that would not occur on a legal copy. After that message, Spyro the game started acting strange. At first, it's only a few small problems. An egg you previously collected was suddenly missing, some gems would disappear. The entrance to an area you just went into was locked again. The game grew unstable, crashing more and more frequently. More eggs went missing, more gems. The game language would switch, you'd be stuck on permanently low health, the travel system broke entirely. The game became a nonsensical labyrinth, being sent to the wrong rooms or entirely wrong worlds at every new area you enter. It's like the game itself was rotting from your presence, doing anything it could to make you stop playing it. The idea of games taking life has, for the longest time, been something naturally unnerving to people. I don't think it's controversial to say that most video games want to be played. However, there are times when a game, even popular games, reject us. The Halo series is known for many things, but one aspect that's always interested me was the fact that you could actually kill your teammates. This is true in both the multiplayer and the campaign, but the campaign is what really catches my eye. In the mainline series of games, you play as Master Chief, this ridiculously powerful and near-perfect super soldier who has an endless loyalty to protecting humanity from galaxy-wide threats. Despite Master Chief being a silent protagonist, his wills and wants are very clearly established. That being said, Master Chief is not the person playing Halo. For the story of these games, outside of cutscenes, he's entirely controlled by you. All main characters are piloted by us, as is the nature of video games, and that creates a weird gap in storytelling that these games need to fill. Master Chief wouldn't kill his allies, but the danger of accidentally killing them is still there, so the games give you some leeway. You can kill a few marines and pass through the level just fine, but if it becomes clear that you're just looking for wanton murder, Halo itself turns on you. The rest of your allies decide to kill you, deciding you've gone rogue, and most of the time succeed in the process. Technically, this is an ending to the story of Halo, in the same way that Master Chief dying in the line of duty is, but this ending doesn't make sense at all. Master Chief, the character, does not go rogue, at least for no reason, meaning in this moment, this isn't Master Chief at all. This is transparently the player going rogue, and the video game itself punishing them for it. Most narrative games have this sort of invisible deal between the player and the character. You're given room to act like the character would, and so long as you do, that invisible line is never crossed. But the moment you stop pretending to be the character, the game stops pretending to have no control over your actions. And as time has gone on, games surrounding this idea, this friction between the player and the character, have become more and more popular. Many games center around rebelling against some powerful meta figure, like a narrator or developer, but it's always, to an extent, self-contained. The Stanley Parable is one of the most meta games out there, with its pure existence being a commentary on video game structure and centering around your relationship with the narrator's wishes. This is an entire genre of video game, ones where you rebel against the narrator in silly and clever ways, but what's important to note is if you play the game, don't press the button, it actually wants you to press the button. If you follow all the narrator's instructions in the Stanley Parable, you get exactly one ending, showing a kind of bland and obvious story about mind control and being a slave to work. Every other ending in the game requires you to have, at some point before or during it, done something the narrator didn't want you to. And despite the game being as meta as it is, it never actually addresses the player. No matter how aware of being in a video game the narrator is, you are always Stanley. And, through this formula, the game is an absolute joy to play. It's silly and light-hearted and clever, its self-awareness is a tool to entertain us, and manages to still immerse us in this weird office world of the Stanley Parable. Let's compare this to another video game, an indie game called Depression Quest. Depression Quest is a text-based adventure game made in 2013, centering around the idea of choice. When you go to the website, you're given a warning that the game covers some dark topics, saying, 
Depression Quest is a game that deals with living with depression in a very literal way. This game is not meant to be a fun or lighthearted experience. From your very first choice, you're presented with a list of options, with the options that would actually help you, options that would be healthy, being directly crossed out. As your depression worsens, fewer and fewer choices are given to you, still tantalizingly there but out of reach. The game could have simply given you the actually available options, but it chooses to show you, the player, that these cannot be picked. The game knows they're the right thing to do, the person in the story does as well, but it's simply impossible. You have three status bars in the game. You are depressed, you are not currently seeing a therapist, you are not currently taking medication for depression. These can all change over the course of the game, and they have a very real effect over your future choices. The entire experience is a desperate crawl out of your depressed state, all while it becomes harder and harder to crawl, and as your depression gets worse, your choices become suffocating. You are profoundly depressed, you are barely functional, and on days you can't even get out of bed at all. At that deep down, the game almost ceases to have choices entirely. You and your character simply subsist, barely sleeping and reacting to whatever random events happen to you. However, while it seems that every option has a downside, and at times there's no way out, the game does have a number of endings. Those status bars can be changed. You can seek therapy, you can get medication, and your mental state can get better. Talking to someone about your problems, scheduling appointments, getting a cat, it is the opposite of fantasy. You pick and choose your battles and fight in any way you can, even when your best option is still bad. Depression Quest is deeply aware of the role of games, and uses that expectation to make the player feel crushed by their lack of real choice. Three years after the release of Depression Quest came an itch.io game called Solitudo, or Solitude. You start the game dropped into a small apartment. A gentle guitar song is playing through your laptop speakers, and you're given the power to interact with nearly everything in your room. On your bed is a diary, with an entry reading, I think I will not leave this room anymore. Yesterday I had a wonderful night with that guy, but after all I bored him with my fears and insecurities. He left and will not come back. I'm hurt and scared. He doesn't need me like this. No one needs me. I cannot change. I will spend some more decades here, until all that's left after me is just a fetid black spot. There are a few more notes, some objects to throw around, but quickly the only thing that's left to do becomes glaringly obvious. See what's outside the apartment. One last warning tells you that you can order food online, go on welfare, that bathrooms are overrated, but none of that matters to the player, because we don't actually live here. The character does. However, right now, we're in control. With all the content in the room gone, you try to step outside, but... You are allowed to leave the room, but all you can find is this spacious black void. As you approach the giant looming text, noise starts to build around you from no particular source. A mix of looming bassy drone, indecipherable whispers, and reverse speech. And this is the entire game. A few Let's Play channels covered Solitude around the time of its release, and you can really see them struggle to hit the 10 minute mark. Because while most games go through the elaborate processes to get across the feelings of the character to the player, Solitude has no such intentions. To get across the feeling of isolation, most games would have the door locked, despite the character having the ability to open it, because while the world to the character might be miserable, looking around outside would be nothing but more content to the person playing it. But Solitude lets you, the player, open it. In Halo, when you go against the desire of the game, it simply slaps your wrist and resets you back to the previous save. In Solitude, we can leave while the character canonically stays inside. And as a result, we see the world that our protagonist does in a way that only the player can see. An empty void of anxiety and misery. Anatomy is a game about a sickness. You are placed, without explanation, in a house. Your goal is to collect tapes. In fact, the game itself tells you to collect tapes, with no further explanation or in-game reasoning. And so, you do. With each tape, you're given a monologue by a nameless person, maybe a philosopher, maybe a scientist, lecturing on the importance of houses to the human psyche. After each tape ends, you're sent to a new part of the house, getting familiar with its layout and structure, all while you hear more and more from this voice in the tape. The monologue goes out of its way to compare the house to a living being. 
Several entries are dedicated towards comparing the anatomy of our bodies to the rooms of a house, a comparison that seems out there at first, but makes more sense as the speaker continues. The hallways and corridors of a house are its veins, providing circulation coursing throughout its frame. The windows of a house serve much the same purpose as eyes, and anyone who has ever rounded a bend or a long drive and come suddenly face to face with a tall, dark manor will tell you that it is difficult to shake the impression that the house, through its lightless windows, is a creature capable of vision and intelligence. The house in this game is equivalent to another living being, the video game itself. Even beyond the idea that your entire experience takes place in and is entirely related to the house, when it decides to reject you, it acts through the structure of the game itself. A few tapes in, and suddenly the illusion of reality starts to fall apart. Models become visibly displaced from where they're meant to be, paintings phase out of reality, the volume of the tape record suddenly spikes in volume and fizzles out, the text guiding you corrupts and falls apart, the tapes themselves become disjointed, the audio is corrupted, you find a tape floating in the air, and once you're finally directed to enter the basement, the subconscious of the house, the game itself crashes. If you reboot it, you once again hear the sound of a tape being inserted, a sound indicating that you're choosing to re-enter this place. You spawn in the bedroom, the mind of the house, with everything significantly more corrupted. A red hue covers the game as long, connected sinews shoot through the walls, phasing in and out of existence. Clumps of moving tissue crowd the hallways, endlessly merging in with itself. The structure of the house, its objects, are entirely scattered and barely recognizable, only the layout remains, and, after you run out of tapes, only one place is left for you to explore. The basement. As you look around, you find the staircase you entered has disappeared entirely, as the speaker, the voice coming from the walls, has one final message for you. There is an important distinction that must be drawn between the words deception and vivisection, a distinction that would appear to be lost on you. Did it not occur to you that as an organism existing within a greater organism, your intrusion would be felt, and now you will be swallowed? Because the truth is this, when a house is both hungry and awake, every room becomes a mouth. If you pirate Spyro Year of the Dragon, you are treated like the exact thing you are, an invading force. The game, understanding what you need from it, entertainment, becomes sick. Its organs, its functions, slowly become difficult and obstinate. The music disappears, the world is made unstable, and by the end of the game, it eventually consumes you whole, destroying all of your progress and leaving you back at the start with absolutely nothing left. The fear that anti-piracy measures inject into us is something as unsettling as it is primal. It's a reminder of the true relationship between us and the game, one normally designed to make us forget it ever existed. The knowledge that a video game knows you're there, and that, sometimes, it really doesn't want you to be. In the relationship between the player and the character, it's important to note that we're not the only ones that suffer from it. Spec Ops The Line released in 2012, the same year as CSGO, Black Ops 2, and Borderlands 2, but it interpreted the shooter genre in a very different way. The gameplay of Spec Ops The Line isn't anything particularly special, and that's for a good reason. The game, for the first time player, is meant to come off as nothing more than a large scale shooter story where you play as a borderline superhuman saving an entire city. Nothing new. That city in particular is Dubai, with the game starting six months after a series of increasingly disastrous sandstorms. While the elite of the city evacuated in secret, the citizens are trapped, surrounded by an endless desert and cut off from the rest of the world, with only the strongest radio signals being able to cut through. You control Captain Martin Walker, the leader of the US Army's Delta Force after getting a transmission two weeks prior from the heart of the city, from none other than Colonel John Conrad. Conrad was a decorated war hero, and the leader of the 33rd Infantry Battalion. When the disasters began, on the way home from Afghanistan, Conrad volunteered the 33rd to help with evacuation. However, when they were told to evacuate the city themselves, when the sandstorms became too much to bear, he and the rest of the 33rd defected from the US Army entirely. After months of silence, though, the transmission made something clear. This is Colonel John Conrad, United States Army. Has the evacuation of Dubai ended in complete failure. 
death toll. In the search for survivors, you're almost immediately met with a group of hostile insurgents. After dealing with them, you get a live distress signal from a group asking for help from the 33rd, but you're just barely too late to save them. One of their own was kidnapped, McPherson, to a place called The Nest. And, seeing far more people alive than you expected in the first 20 minutes in the city, Walker makes a decision. To see what's really going on here, and to save everyone he can. Confusion is a common theme running through Spec Ops The Line. The game opens in the middle of a helicopter fight, only to have your crew hit by another falling chopper as it cuts to black. The majority of the game is spent getting back to that point, but once you finally do, it's not the exact same sequence. Once you take off and find yourself back where you started, Walker says, Wait! Wait, this isn't right! Well, it's too late now! No, no, I mean, we did this already! What do you mean? Ah, oh, fuck it! It's nothing! Just shake these fucking guys! While the game eventually becomes surreal, the characters never get this explicitly meta at any other point. That helicopter scene isn't a fourth wall break, it's Walker recognizing that these events are truly happening again. According to lead narrative designer Walt Williams, Walker recognizing these events repeating isn't an easter egg or a nod to the audience, but an implication that the game doesn't jump around in time at all. The first helicopter crash did happen before all of the events we've seen. A narrative rule revealed to fans after the game was released gives us a much deeper look into what's really going on. At the end of each and every scene, it will fade out to either black or white. If it fades to white, the next scene will be, in some parts, a hallucination. The interesting thing is that the intro to the game, the one after the helicopter crash and the very first fade out we ever see, fades to white, well before anything strange starts to happen. While the first half of the game plays as a high action third person shooter in a truthfully really cool location, the entire tone and direction of Spec Ops The Line switches in an instance, with one fatal mistake. While you get into several firefights with the 33rd, assuming you're part of the CIA trying to kill them for going rogue, God damn it, we are not CIA! an actual CIA agent decides to help you out. His name is Agent Gould, and he seems to have the same goals as you, to evacuate as many citizens as possible. As you go to meet up with him though, he's captured and eventually executed before you can learn his and the CIA's plans to do so. All you get from his body is a map leading to a place called The Gate. The most natural assumption in a game like this is that it's a base that needs to be taken, and so Walter and the rest of Delta Force move to take it. Sneaking in, you find yourself next to a mortar launcher, one with white phosphorus, a dangerous and incredibly cruel chemical weapon. Seeing no other way to clear out the place with so many people there, you decide to use it, and blanket the entire base with it, killing countless soldiers in the process. Once you drop down into the encampment though, you and Walker realize something horrifying. Gould wasn't trying to take the base. He was trying to free the civilians trapped there. Beyond this point, you are no longer playing a regular shooter. Conrad, the colonel you've been trying to find over the course of the game, finally makes an appearance in the form of a voice and a radio, one you find soon after leaving the gate. In contrast to the war hero Walker knew him as, this Conrad is cartoonishly evil. When I served under him in Kabul, he was an honorable man. Because I saved your life, I've saved many lives, Captain. I've ended even more. Far more evil than anything or anyone else the game has thrown at you at this point, as your hallucinations become more and more frequent. The idea of choice is brought up over and over, in the context of how pointless it is in this game. In the moments just before the white phosphorus killing at the gate, you're told... You're fucking kidding, right? That's white phosphorus. Yeah, I know what it is. You've seen what this shit does. You know we you can't might not have a choice, Lugo. There's always a choice. No. There's really not. The interesting thing about this interaction is that both of them are actually right, depending on who is being spoken to. Walker has no choice. We've been controlling him since the very start of the game. But once we approach the mortar launcher, we, the player, need to press that button. Just like with the helicopter scene, Walker seems to know the situation he's trapped in, somewhat. While it's never said explicitly, this game is very aware of the split between the player and the character, and uses that relationship to punish both of them. Many people have analyzed this game under the lens of making the player feel guilty, subverting the military hero power fantasy that most shooters have, but it, in my opinion, shines an even brighter light onto the hellish situation these main characters are put in. 
According to Walt Williams, Walker is trapped in a hell of his own creation. But I think, in an even greater sense, that Walker is trapped in a hell of the video game's creation. It's easy to forget that the original objective of Spec Ops The Line was simply to check if there were survivors, a task accomplished in the first five minutes of the game. If Walker did what he was supposed to, there would be no video game. In order for Spec Ops The Line to happen, Walker had to disobey orders. He had to try to be the hero, or he wouldn't exist at all. He and every other video game protagonist is trapped in an endless loop, being replayed millions and millions of times all over the globe, suffering and dying and losing friends and allies, all as a means for our entertainment. Spec Ops The Line being a video game is also important specifically because of this idea of control. The game is a linear story with some minor choices that don't really affect anything in the long run, but the form of control we, as the player, get to exercise is if we want to keep playing. The guilt we feel is not just for the suffering we inflict on these fictional innocent lives, but also the guilt of knowing that we still want to keep going. When we see the button prompt to launch that white phosphorus, we do have a choice. That choice isn't to change the story, but to stop playing it entirely. Because the only thing that happens from here is pure, painful suffering. The game has a few more twists and turns before we get back to the second helicopter scene, like destroying all the water reserves in Dubai, leaving everyone for dead, you know, small stuff. But after the crash, the game abandons any semblance of reality. Figuring that Conrad would put himself at the highest vantage point in the city, you and the rest of Delta Force make your way to the tower. However, your two friends, the last anchors holding you to reality, swiftly meet their end. Lugo, right after the crash, is taken away and surrounded by some of the abandoned citizens, being blamed for all the chaos that's unfolded over the course of the game, eventually being overrun and murdered. Right before you and Adams get to the base of the tower, you're surrounded by the 33rd. Adams, refusing to surrender, gives you the cover fire you need to run away, being killed off screen. However, after he's taken care of, the rest of the 33rd seem to disappear along with him, leaving you entirely alone with Conrad's voice to guide you. I'm sorry, Walker, but you knew it would end this way. <coughs> Your friends, dead, in a world on fire, and you, alone. <coughs> You're a failure. <coughs> Finally, something we have in common. The firepower that killed Adams is suddenly gone, and you finally find yourself at the base of the tower. Despite being defenseless, the supposed last of the 33rd, just nine total men, surrender to you, asking you to meet Conrad upstairs. However, once you meet Conrad, the truth to it all is finally revealed. He's dead. He's been dead, and has been for a long, long time. The Conrad who Walker's been speaking to, the evil, ruthless monster he can blame for all of his problems, never existed. The justification for murdering all of what's left of the 33rd, the journey to get to this relentless monster, never existed in the first place. You launched a mortar that murdered 47 innocent people for absolutely nothing at all. Conrad speaks to both Walker and us. It seems that reports of my survival have been greatly exaggerated. This is impossible. Oh, I assure you, it is. How? Not how. Why? You were never meant to come here. We have our orders. Leave the city, radio command from outside the Stormwall. They send in the cavalry, we go home. What happened here was out of my control. Was it? None of this would have happened if you'd just stopped. But on you marched. The truth, Walker, is that you're here because you wanted to feel like something you are not. A hero. At the end of this conversation, you're faced with a decision. To shoot Conrad, to continue to blame someone else, or to shoot Walker and take responsibility yourself. The game knows that shooting Walker isn't a suicide, and for the very first time, both you and Walker are on screen at the same time separately. You control his actions. You dragged him through this hell. And as your final choice, you can choose whether he lives or dies. 
because from the very start of this game, he was nothing more than a vessel for your entertainment. He never had a choice in the first place. Ultimately, most games want to be played. Even acting at your worst, most games will simply reset you or even let you get away with anything, but that makes the games that go a step beyond something to behold. Obviously, these games are not sentient. They don't have real wants or desires, but neither do the characters in these stories. And yet, we still get immersed. And so, when we're faced with the game itself making a choice for us, interrupting us, or speaking to us directly, for just a moment, it can feel deeply, deeply real. Thanks for watching, and have a nice day. If you enjoyed the video and want to see more of my stuff in the future, please subscribe to this channel. If you want to support me even further, I have a Patreon that pays out only when I release a video. For just $2 a video, you can get a direct line to me and other patrons, any extra content I release, your name at the end of videos, and even the number of goals I need to fill if they're met. Ah. If you want to support me, that is the best way to do it. And finally, shout out to my higher tier donors. Cecilio, Clear Was Here, Jared Chode, Mendel, Wallace de Morinville, Arkin Atlan, Brody Larson, Congruent Crib, Dankly Voidly, Edmund Dong, SC, Great Value Gaming, Grinkle Snickle, Lavender, MF Bitch Boy, Tactical Cheese, Willem, Words can words truly cannot describe how much I hate this one human, he is disgusting, ha ha ha, Zimborg, A Magic Muffin, Bestest Patron, Brian Jackson, Chris Gunther, Zach, Fedimus, Gluggle Jug, Lady Mana, Michael Agosta, Mr. Headcrab, Mr. Trolley Moly, No Joke, Oat Flakes from Outer Space, Ribbon Aster, Robin Michael Becker, Sess, Shaneful, Ted H, Terrifying Spoon, and Undersea. Rexy VT. Thank you so much. That all being said, I sincerely hope you enjoyed. Thank you and have a nice day.